Here we go. All right. Thank How's it going, you. everybody? Um, hope you had a good conference so far. We're on the uh, home stretch, I guess. So this is a this is a presentation which is aimed to be a little bit more fun, um, light-hearted, and yeah, enjoy. Okay. I guess I need this thing, right? Wow. Okay. Does it work? No. Right. Okay. So we are from Entropy, and um, we're an experienced design consultancy in London. And we take an approach to our work which is based around using scientific principles behind the creative process. Um, so I won't really give any more banter about uh, uh, our agency. What we're here to talk to you about is Formula One and hopefully uh, find some relevance in the way that we work. Is there any F1 fans here in the room? Hands up if you, if you like F1. Okay, good. good so hope you, 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 you'll follow us, I think, for most of this then. Um, if you're not an F1 fan, it also doesn't matter, because I think if you're into user experience and user-centered design, you see where we're coming from. Um, so Formula One, um, obviously a um, uh, high-performance sport, and uh, it takes a lot of collaboration, lots of high tech, um, but it's got some great metaphors and some great working practices that we can learn from, and we're just going to touch on a few of these, and then we'll tell you uh, some other perspectives around this. So first of all, such as teamwork, very much like uh, pit crews in uh, Formula One, where you have multidisciplinary teams coming together, such here as the all working in harmony to optimize that user's experience and help him perform the best as we can. And that's very much like bringing together multidisciplinary teams, as I was saying, just to come together, co-create, and just really, really design engaging experiences. So, so really central to use clear communication. I mean, again, it's an obvious point that we often make, but in Formula One, it's absolutely essential that that communication is short and to the point. So the relationship actually is much more on a human level. It's about the relationship between a race engineer and the driver in real time, and they only have milliseconds to be able to communicate essential points that will help them optimize that race journey. It's a bit like tweeting, actually. It's almost, we only have that 140 characters that we can throw out into the internet in the hope that it's understood and received and it's actionable in some manner. So the, the, it helps us get down to the finer points of um, how we need to communicate. But really, it's the user-centered design principles within Formula One is what we found to be most interesting. And that's why we wanted to share this story with you. So I guess most of us here are hopefully familiar with user-centered design and whether you use this particular format of it, but the idea really is the iterative cycle that we go through with the users in the center. And Formula One is, is like you know, most, of these, uh, most of these ideas in that, based around that user. The drivers in this case are, I guess, the main users of Formula One. But it's important, as usual, to remember that users are, can't be dehumanized. Actually, they're real people. And we often forget that when it comes to user-centered design. And I think the theme of the conference over the last two days has really made that point that it's human experiences where our focus is really now heading. So it's the same principle that we need to apply. And when we're designing um, around users or humans or people, um, using a persona is often a great tool to be able to encapsulate that idea. And whether it's a persona for a driver like Lewis Hamilton and figuring out what characteristics we can to understand about that uh, part of the audience and how can we use that to design and optimize the best possible experience, it's a great place to start. But there are other um, audiences in Formula One as well. It's not just the drivers. The, the real users are the wider fans and they're the, they're the paying customer. So we also need personas that help us understand how their experience of the sport will be. So, for example, somebody who likes the experience of Formula One, a bit of a casual fan, I guess. Someone who, you know, maybe it, it likes the drama, the glamour, and is less maybe interested in the sporting element of it, and a little bit more interested in how it actually makes them feel, and it's a bit more of a passive relationship. Allow me to introduce you to Hamad here. He's a, he characterizes a fanatical fan who is more about the performance and the technical aspects of the sport. So coming at it from a different point of view, someone who likes to keep, to keep in touch with all the stats and all the, all the intrinsic things which are going on. Um, also a, a user which needs to be designed for in this uh, wider, wider field. So once we have the personas as such, we then need to design a journey, very much like we're designing a website or an app. And in the case of Formula One, we've got um, racetracks. So they, they have all the different twists and turns that make, uh, make 
make, the, make it a racetrack, but also build in the different elements of drama, the experience and the challenges along the way. So here's an example of a racetrack in, in Belgium. Uh, this is an exciting racetrack on the, on the, on the Formula One calendar. Uh, drivers love it, fans love it, and uh, it really has all those elements of uh, uh, an engaging experience. It's a great example of a journey, I think. And you know, journey design is obviously one of the things we often really focus on, um, more so even now with service design, and actually trying to understand the entire journey um, in, in an end-to-end -end experience. And Formula One does that really well in that it doesn't just have singular journeys of, 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 of racetracks, but it's the journey over the course of a season and those individual journeys and the differences between them. And it, it's, it, it, it takes the journey and it takes the experience to those locations and makes it accessible actually and tries to actually break down the barriers and the perceptions that it has about not being able to see or experience the sport and whether that's conducting a, a race where you have to go out of your way like Belgium to really get the atmosphere and the environment or whether it's a street race where it puts it in the heart of your own home city um, so that you can feel it more, more so for yourself. And that goes all the way through to breaking new markets, such as they often try to do in America, so far with limited success. But actually showcasing the sport, or showcasing their product in this case, in a way that they can gather interest and start designing experiences and almost service mapping, what would it actually take to bring this sport to this environment? What stakeholders are we needing? What other support systems need to be in place? If you've ever done service design, it works exactly that way, where we map out the entire blueprint of what needs to be in place, and then put that all together to create an end-to-end -end experience. Um, there was a great example of this was right here in Warsaw and did anybody see when uh, Felipe Massa came to town with his Ferrari? I think you'll enjoy that. I think it just brings a nice point about actually trying to bring the product and let people experience it for themselves. And there's a lesson for us to learn there, actually, about making ourselves accessible and taking our products to our users and our communities and our customers, as opposed to always waiting for them to come to us. OK, so just going to the next point here. So we've got the uh, personas, and we've got the, uh, uh, the user journey, which we've developed. Very much like in design, we have to uh, prototype this as well. So like in F1, they use uh, virtual simulators for the drivers to test out the tra tracks, the cars, get, get up to date, their date on all the new technology updates, um, and very much focus on this user. So looking here, we've got a seat designed for Lewis Hamilton. He's got uh, a seat made bespoke for him to optimize the performance in the car and make it comfortable for him. Another example here is a, a steering wheel. Clearly two, uh, two variants here. Uh, both, both drivers uh, are in the same team, but they have their own setup and their own user interface optimized for them. Here's a little short video on, uh, on that. Mercedes have adapted the buttons and switches on Hamilton's wheel to more closely resemble the colours and configuration he was familiar with at McLaren. Looking at a comparison of the back of the two driver's steering wheels, you can see how Hamilton's setup differs from that of Rosberg's. I mean it would be great if we were able to design our experiences and our products and our apps with that level of bespoke user friendliness, right, to actually get the maximum performance out of it. But I guess the spirit of the message remains the same, is to try and understand the ergonomic characteristics or the interaction design that is going to make that as optimal for the user as opposed to what the actual functions it's going to conduct are going to be. Um, and what is actually really interesting that we're seeing even more so in sports like Formula One is, you know, whilst they have simulators and all of this advanced technology to be able to replicate the experience and test it and optimize it, but actually what's really interesting is that in this case, 
there was a, 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 a gaming champion for the GT Championship, you know, pretty sophisticated stuff, re very, very realistic. And he's actually now been recruited by Red Bull Racing to be a real driver in their driver academy. And that fusion of the digital and physical worlds is happening more and more all the time. And I think that gives us a huge opportunity as designers, largely in digital design or indeed service design, to actually think about how can we use those different environments and touch points to enhance the experience. And again, F1's really leading the way with that second and third screen experience of being able to not only watch the sport, but take access to the data or integrate with social media in real time. And this is really about um, multi-sensory environments and digital touch points at their, at their peak. Okay, so it's important to uh, conduct usability testing when we when we when we launch products as well. Make sure it validates the concept and the the optimization we put through. So in Formula One, they have teams of people who sit on a pit wall and record the telemetry of the actual race car, the engines, the races, and all that sort of things. Just to make sure it's all working in harmony. Very much like what we do when we do lab-based testing to understand what the user uh, or how the user's interactions with a say a new app or website. So. Also, alongside the uh, usability testing, it's very important to uh, consider data in this, uh, uh, in this way. So using analytics, um, such as telemetry from races, looking for patterns, trends, weaknesses, and opportunities, very much like how we use um, analytics for websites, conversion funnels, and just recording, seeing what uh, users do along a user journey. So you've got a mixture there of qual and quant, really, which is important. And so to kind of start getting towards back to this full circle of user-centered design, this is all about iterative improvement. All of that research, all of that insight, all of that uh, development goes into actually improving the product in incremental ways. And again, Formula One's got a great history over 60 years of showing how small, small updates to the product and the design and the configuration can make a br really, really big difference. And uh, I really like this clip to show you the highlight of what that means from a design perspective. I think that's pretty cool. I think that really highlights you know, the, the subtle changes, but at the same time, it's still fundamentally a race car. Um, but those iterative improvements make it relevant, make it um, effective, and give it that efficiency to be suitable for the current time. Um, but when all is said and done, Formula One is still a sport. It still has governance, it has rules, it has regulations. And in fact, they change on a regular basis. In a way, that doesn't happen with a lot of other sports. You know, football doesn't decide to suddenly put the goalpost in the middle of the football field just to make it a bit more fun for people. But Formula One has a habit of kind of twisting and shaping the rules to try and manipulate what the experience is going to be or what the outcome of a race might be. Um, and it's a bit like what we actually find in web development or software development in that we also have the same sort of restrictions, but they change and they twist, and we have to keep up to date with them. So whether it's W3 standards or whether it's browser configurations or whether it's different mobile platforms that we have to develop with, but even with, though we work in that same environment, innovation can still occur. So in the same way that in Formula One, it takes you know, genius ideas to say, well, within these restrictions, this is how we're gonna find those extra seconds or milliseconds that means life and death. It means um, uh, between the difference between winning and losing. It's the same for us to innovate within the web standards that we have available to us. You know, whether you're a, a giant like Facebook or Google or an upstart, we still have the same environment. A lot of it actually boils down to HTML and CSS in the end when it comes to the web but innovation can still occur. So it's our interpretation of those rules is what's really important. But actually, whilst that's all a great story, I think, so there's obviously some parallels between Formula One and user-centered design. Actually, when it comes to UCD, I think F1's a bit OCD in that respect, in that it's the really extreme example, isn't it, about how you optimize on the exact point for the exact user all the way. And we can't obviously go to that level of extent, but I think, we're, Formula One has a danger of going too far. We also have a danger in our own um, work in digital design and uh, software design of maybe going too far. I mean, user-centered design is all well and good, but it can go too far, and we can become a bit obsessive about only looking at it from even that one perspective. 
I mean, we don't want to get to a point where you have to be a psychologist or a neuroscientist to, just to design a website. But at the same time, that's often what we're having to now do. And that, I think, leads to maybe overcomplicating the situation sometimes as well. And the over-engineering that can occur is actually really interesting because in this case with, uh, uh, with Formula One, the aerodynamics have gotten to such an extent that it actually affects the race experience and the outcomes for the teams. So the design, you know, if the designers had their way, then they'd be focusing purely on the technical aspects of it. You just have supercars which are just out of the, they just run away with it and you have something like this, which is, you know, performance enhanced, the, t the technology's there, but really, where's the experience? Where's, where's, how's that been uh, designed into it? Well, we start to try and manipulate the outcome. So, whereas Formula One will introduce tyres that blow up in the middle of the race or degrade a lot more than you'd expect them to. So it actually creates a little bit of drama and a little bit of suspense, but it's also a little bit falsified and it's not really what the whole process was supposed to be about. And we find the same sort of thing happening in web development or in application development where there's a new cool JavaScript library or let's make it parallax because it will be cool and we can mask something with a bit of rich media. But is that really enhancing the experience or is it deliberately manipulating the experience so that we try and make it more engaging? And it often loses focus in terms of what was the real purpose of the user's journey. And it's the same in terms of the technology being introduced to um, artificially support overtaking, like introducing a DRS system on the wings of the car, um, or the engines um, being developed in such a way now where they're all about efficiency and about making the, the uh, environmental friendliness and making it appeal to people, and ultimately that technology degrading back down to road cars, which we often see again in, in web development, software development, where R&D and sort of big data and all of these concepts will ultimately become more accessible through APIs and uh, code and libraries and frameworks. Um, but there's some consequences that we should be aware of. And I think the one that I'd really like to highlight here about what that means in terms of the wider experience is the sound experience of Formula One. So those of you who obviously know the sport, or even for those of you who don't, that the way that the sport feels from that point of view is hugely important. Now that was, if you didn't know, that was cycling through the last three engine types that they've had in the sport, from a V10 to a V8, and the last one was the current V6. And I'm sure you probably agree that last one was a little bit more uncomfortable to listen to. And that actually creates quite a big commercial impact. And as I'll let Bernie explain. The impact of that is huge in a sport like Formula One because something as simple as the sound being wrong creates a whole massive amount of uh, disenfranchisement and disconnection with the sport. Drivers aren't experiencing it the same way. We think about moving around. It's like with customers. If the, if the journey, if the field if experience all goes wrong, we start thinking about going elsewhere, and that, that really creates disruption. And obviously, you heard it creates impact right on the bottom line too. So the customer experience is actually really important to factor in, not just the usability of the, uh, of the utility or the application that we're building. And uh, I'll, I'll skip through these a little bit quicker because I think we're running a little bit behind time. 
But um, with Abu Dhabi, in, uh, the racetrack's been amazingly created with all the funds and all the, uh, all, all the pieces that you would want, but it doesn't have the right driver experience and doesn't make for a great bit of entertainment. Whereas in South Korea, after three years, their track failed, despite the same sort of level of investment, but they didn't get the customer experience right, it wasn't accessible enough as a track, and it failed in the way that it connected. So the usability was there, but the customer experience of what it meant to connect with it was slightly off. And that kind of brings us to the brand experience that we need to be aware of as well. So in the case here of, with Red Bull, on their ascent to success in Formula One, it was fantastic, and it really represented the brand values that they held in terms of performance and winning and you know, really having that energy effect. Um, but it, get, it got too much. It started becoming a problem, and actually the brand's own desires from the experience of the sport took over, and the race manipulation started to become apparent and it became a disconnection with the actual fan base, and that creates a brand problem, and uh, that's not really what they're about, and we've seen this before. That's right, so uh, like how we saw Windows rise up in the 90s, um, you know, people wanted that to happen, was, you know, the technology was uh, enabling lots of different uh, experiences and connecting a lot of things together, but we got a little bit scared, a bit uncomfortable with how, how big Microsoft was getting. So Google came along, you know, that was a bit of a breath of fresh air, really, getting big, and we all loved that. They did some cool stuff, um, which was great, we're loving it, but now we're starting to get a little bit uncomfortable where it is now. So, you know, you've got to be careful about your overall experience that you're, you're, you're offering here. And yeah, should, 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 uh, should you not play it properly and, you know, not consider all of the service, brand, customer and user touch points, you know, the wheels can come off. So where do we go from here? So just like in Formula One, there's a need for an alignment. And actually, there's a need for an alignment in the design industry. And I think that time is now. And it's not just people like ourselves and everybody here in this room who feels that, but it seems to be a momentum in our entire industry, which I think is really exciting. Um, the link that I've just put up there is to an article by Jesse James Garrett of Adaptive Path. If you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend it. It's a short article, but it really just highlights the convergence that's happening between the worlds of user experience, service experience, customer experience, etc. And actually, when we start to now think properly about holistic experience design, it gives us a whole new way of thinking about what it means to actually connect from different touch points. It's no longer just about usability. It's no longer just about the journey. But even from the customer's perspective in terms of co uh, commercial transactions, and also back to branding. So we're, we're sort of veering into territories that are already established and related, but we happen to be more disciplined about how we are actually now able to invade on that maybe new territory to us, whereas actually we can't do it in an uh, unfamiliar manner. And I think what this is really creating is what we've now heard the term becoming more commonly heard of, certainly even the last two days we've heard it consistently, which is experience design. And I think, you know, whether you, 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 you were previously more associated to sort of BX for brand experience or CX for customer experience or whatever it happened to be, that's that convergence, I think, is what's really exciting. And it just so happens to be that if you converge them in this manner, it creates an X in the middle. So I think it's the experience is really now what we're focusing on as, a part, as opposed to the prefix that is attached to it. So we've been looking at this for some time and we've actually looked at what are those individual um, experience uh, cornerstones, I guess, um, from brand to customer to service and, and user. And actually you can think of that a little bit almost like the user-centered design lifecycle itself. So if we keep the user in the center of that box and work with all of those environments around them, then it gives us an opportunity to make sure we're not missing the actual way that we experience things holistically. And we can start to layer that up with different outputs and tools and techniques that help us bind those individual experience cornerstones together in a simple way, just using simple shapes, simple geometry, and simple relationships diagrammatically. We all love a good diagram in experience design, come on, we, we all do. But we can also continue to develop that as a tool and make it more functional and practical. So rather than just a life cycle like UCD to say, hey, let's follow it this way as a process, we can start to make this more of a practical way to say, how do I actually now start dealing with that? What are the actual connected points that I can start using? What are those tools? And we can continue to sort of add levels of detail within this framework that we've been developing and think about this is how we can actually focus it on a particular corner, or this is actually if the corner we're you know, really focused on is, say, for example, customer experience, what are the opposite experiences that we need to not lose focus on? And therefore, what are the areas of development or the outputs or the deliverables that we might need to be aware of that can help us influence that? 
I've gone through that a little bit quick towards the end, I guess also because we're out of time. But the moral of the story there is that this is a framework that we've developed at Entropy. Um, and it's actually being published next month in a new magazine out of, I think, the US or Australia called Experience Design, so XD Magazine. Because I think we are in that change of moment in our industry now where that's the momentum. And so hopefully something like this framework gives you guys an open toolkit to be able to actually now start really working with all of those individual experience cornerstones. And uh, yeah, we'll hope to uh, share it with you. And thank you very much for listening to how we've taken Formula One all the way through to a holistic experience. So thank you. Thank you. All right, good. <laughs>